Hi there. My name is Jeremy Thomas, and I am the host of Shed Talks. Shed Talks hopes to be an entertaining, informative podcast, and I hope you're going to like it. I'm going to be in conversation with well-known, interesting figures, personalities from the world of film, telly, music, gardening, sport, and literature, and even prisons. Each person will have a serious connection with mental health, and we are going to learn loads. You don't have to be over 18, but it might just help. Enjoy. Welcome to Shed Talks, episode 13. Our next guest, when warned that he might be asked some really personal possibly intrusive questions during his Shed Talk encounter, responded, bring it on. At my age, he said, things like that don't tend to worry me too much. So we're extremely fortunate, chuffed and lucky. And what can we say to welcome our very first member of the House of Lords and unbelievably our eldest guest ever on this show, a uh, huge welcome to Lord Clive Brook of Arbuthorpe. Clive, welcome. Hello, Jeremy. Great to have you here. Really, really good. Let's kick off. I mean, we know that there is many things to talk about in terms of your spectacular career uh, in trade unions and so forth. But I want to just get to the personal. You were born in 1942. You are 80 years old and the youngest 80 I've ever met. Um, the son of John, John Brook and Mary Colbeck. And you, you brought up in Wakefield in Yorkshire and you had three elder brothers, Fred, Frank and Jack. Yes. Was that a happy family? Was it good times? Do you remember? Uh, I've got good times to remember, but there were some problems within the family which uh, were nicely hidden. Oh. I, I was I was a mistake. I was born in the middle of the war. My mother and father had three boys in three years, and then they went 12 years, and I popped out. Wow. Right. <laughs> so I was almost an only child, and uh, so I was a mistake in the first instance. As my father told me, I'd, uh, I'd been the worst day's work he'd done. They'd had a weekend away when he came home from the war, and they'd been across to Blackpool, and I was conceived, I gather, in Lancashire, in Blackpool. Right. And I see once told me the worst day's work in his life. And that <laughs> gives you a bit of an indication of the kind of relationship I had with my father. Yeah. Um, so I was a mistake. Uh, and the second thing is then when I popped out, I was not the girl he wanted, but I was another boy. And I think that was an influential factor in the nature of the relationship between the two of us. And also my uh, relationship with nature, uh, with life. Uh, I think I should have been a girl, and I in part had this uh, desire as a child to be the girl my father wanted. Really? Uh, but, of course, uh, I, I was a boy. And, uh, right. It, I think, created the conflicts in me, which um, uh, have been quite a factor in, in my early life and, well, in my later life too, which uh, have uh, led me on the route I followed. Do you mean that in the sense that you were sort of uh, quite, you know, a sensitive, um, sensitive child and interested in things that perhaps boys weren't interested in, or it, was it not that obvious? Yes, it was. It was a bit like that. My my brother next to me was a very good sportsman. He was very bright. He played rugby union for Wakefield, for Yorkshire, and for the British Army. My father was a sportsman, a keen cricketer. And oh. sports, were, sports was about the last thing I was ever interested in. I was more on the arty side. Yeah. And in fact, I recollect uh, I, I used to irritate him intensely by uh, doing a, a little bit of semi ballet dancing in front of him. And oh, right, to, right. used so to drive was, him up the wall. That was pretty <laughs> confrontational. Yes. So there was there was that element to me, but of course I was a male, uh, but uh, with a strong feminine side. Right, interesting, very interesting. What about your mum? My mum, uh, I was thinking about her this morning. Uh, uh, interestingly, my mum was uh, a driver, wanted to uh, make achievements and progress for her children, particularly. 
Uh, she'd had a poor relationship with her mother, but had been much loved by her father. And uh, she had a father's traits. Uh, she was uh, musical, intelligent, had the opportunity to go to a grammar school, but her parents wouldn't permit it. She was pushed into the mill. Right. And, and was a weaver uh, from right. fairly early on. Interestingly, my mother was carrying me. Uh, she was working as a weaver. My father was away during the war. She was looking after the three boys, and she had an accident when she was walking to work early in the morning in the dark. Right. In a blackout, and uh, apparently was laid on the floor and uh, was found uh, an hour or so later. And I've been told subsequently that uh, that accident when I was in the womb possibly had quite a bearing on, on my nature too. Right, right. Quite a lot of medical research on this about trauma. Yeah, that's an interesting point to know. And what happened to your mum? Was she all right? She was all right, and she she shaken, I think, for a couple of days, but then back to work. Uh, so she was a grafter. She was hardworking. She was intelligent, and she was keen for her children to do well, particularly educationally. Were you a favourite? I was very much the favourite, and mm. uh, in, and she told everybody I was the favourite. Right. <laughs> Didn't right. help me in my relationship with my brothers. Or your father. <laughs> <laughs> or my father. I think I, and I tended to come between. I was. I spent the first two years of my life uh, sleeping with my mother because my father was away, and then I was kicked out of the bed yeah. when my father returned uh, at the war's end, and uh, I went to sleep with one of my brothers. And uh, so I, I, it was a fallout with my father all the way down the line. <laughs> very, very interesting. And I mean, you know, having three elder brothers, I mean, could either be a dream <laughs> or it could be a nightmare. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't, yeah, maybe I, I this didn't... is where you learned to become <laughs> such a good negotiator. <laughs> well, it was with my, the, my brother next to me, uh, who was a very good sportsman and I wasn't. And uh, there was, he'd been the youngest, of course, until I came along. And I think they'd wanted him to be a girl with your photographs of him dressed as a girl. Can you believe it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, uh, but he was, he was very much uh, the sports, the male sportsman. And uh, I was rather envious, I think, of, uh, of the way he was seen and perceived by my father and the way he was so successful with the sports. And we didn't get along very well because he then saw I was very attached to my mother. And yeah. I think he was always a little bit jealous of that. So there was uh, enmity between us uh, for much of our lives. But we did make up later in life and became good friends. Oh, good. Right. But OK, so you went to um, Thorns House School in Wakefield, grammar school. Was that easy peasy Japanesey because you were naturally bright? You know, what was it like? I'd been very, uh, I was bright at uh, infant school and at junior school. I was top of the class, past the 11 plus, went to grammar school and then discovered that my brain probably wasn't as big as some of those around. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't uh, the star that I had been uh, earlier in educational terms, so I, uh, I found that a little bit difficult to, to accept. I found a new role for myself. Uh, firstly, I became my, my, my best friend and he became my best man, he's still around in touch with me. An extraordinary bright chap, became a, a physicist, a nuclear physicist. Um, I attached to him as my best friend. Um, and I became a bit of a clown uh, to try and get attention from other people. Um, always in trouble, being given detention and a hundred lines to write for misbehaving. And it was all about, look at me, look at me, yeah. to try to make up for what I felt was my deficiency in yeah. intellectual terms, certainly compared with my friend John. Gosh. So, uh, so uh, I, And I started drinking quite early. I was in with a crowd of people and we used to drink uh, from 11, 12 drinking alcohol oh really right right I was, I was given as i was a late late child birth for my parents they gave me a good deal of freedom i think they felt they'd done all the work with the three boys and i had a a lot of uh, opportunity to do different things and some of which i i shouldn't have been doing really at that age right right well i mean this is interesting isn't it because i mean you know, when we look at, I mean, we'll mix and match here. When we look at you being in the Lords and the things you've achieved are huge, um, you know, but you've been a trustee of the Institute for Public Policy Research, a trustee for Community Service Volunteers, a trustee of Action on Addiction, and most recently a patron of Sugarwise. 
and I mean, we'll come back to that because I know how many questions you've asked uh, and things that you've tabled in the laws, and you are a very, very hardworking bit. But we know that you have got an interest in addiction. Take us back, because it seems to me you had a really spectacularly successful career uh, in public service with trade unions, uh, you know, being on the TUC, ending up on the TUC Executive Committee. But, t- I mean, if you can, talk me through that. Were you, were you just flat out as a young man in your 20s and you know, the Inland Revenue uh, Union really going for it? Well, I, as I said, I was wanting to be looked at. Ah, right. <laughs> Drinking in my early teens, and I left school at 16, and I went into the civil service, got a clerical officer job, and the first day I joined the civil service, I became the union representative for the, the, the staff union that looked after the interests of the, of the employees in the Inland Revenue Inland Revenue Staff Federation, as you mentioned, I, I became the, the voluntary secretary on the first day uh, because the uh, the guy who was holding the post was looking for somebody to replace him. He'd had it too long, he said. So I was in the trade union movement right from the beginning. And, yeah, uh, I found it much more interesting than the the revenue work collecting taxes. Yes, uh, I got the opportunity to 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 organise uh, to go to meetings. I then became the branch secretary for the regional Ireland leads. I then became a delegate going to conferences and I started travelling to different union events. And of course, I also had uh, a lot of company there, mainly men. Um, it, it, it had a majority of women in the union, but it was run mainly in those days by right. the majority of men. And of course, they were all drinkers. We drank right. together. A lot of the men used it as an opportunity to get away from home. They wanted to change the world and to improve conditions, but they also had an opportunity to get some freedom from their other responsibilities. And uh, so I mixed a lot with people like that, and uh, we drank. And that was in your 20s? That was that was in my in my uh, teens. I then got a full time job with the union yeah. in London when I was twenty one. I moved from Yorkshire down to London, right, and and uh, became a full time employee uh, with the Inland Revenue Staff Federation, and and that was everything I wanted. Everything I wanted. Uh, I got a, a chance to try to change the world, to change conditions, to change life around me, change my own life. And uh, off I went. And I was also drinking. <laughs> right. And that <laughs> was... was and that a crowd of, of drinkers. <laughs> but that drinking was... Um, you were sort of getting away with it in the sense of um, y- y- you were just drinking loads and having, you know, going drink, up the ladder, as it were. And Yeah, yeah. We, we drank together every day. We went to the pub at lunchtime or uh, out for lunch eating and drinking and... Uh, and then drinking in the evening as a reward for all the hard work we'd done. It became a, a massive part of my life. And it was also part of the business life. A lot of drinking done in those days, uh, both in the trade union movement and, and in business as well. The the long afternoon uh, lunches were common practice, not yeah. quite so much these days as uh, they used to be. And and it, it grabbed me. Uh, I... Uh, I need a drink as well. I felt uh, when I was in difficulties, if things weren't going right, I'd drink. When I was doing well, I would drink. Uh, drink yeah. was very much a reward for me for having worked hard. Uh, I was living down on the South Coast, commuting into London. I'd often end up uh, going for a, a, a drink at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the evening, and then it, it would be another drink and another up to the West End, into clubs, into uh, after the bars had closed, and then God knows where I ended up. Sometimes I'd be away for a day or two days, shaking my head every day, trying to start afresh, promising I wouldn't drink again, but uh, it, it was a repeat button for many, many years. And uh, I right. got myself into some terrible scrapes, just managing to hang in by the skin of my teeth quite often. But my health started deteriorating. And uh, in my 20s, I married in my mid-20s. My marriage uh, also started uh, to get into difficulties. Um, my 30s were awash with drink and travel, um, public speaking, negotiating, highs and lows, um, a lot of lows. I picked up my alcohol to keep me going. But if I can interrupt you, yes. um, it, what what seems extraordinary in your story is that you became maybe at the expense of uh, of your marriage to to Lorna, 
but you seem to become more and more successful. It's what it seems to me like it was anyway. And yet the drinking and, and, and stuff was getting more and more out of control. It's kind of weird. Well, I mean, the, the amazing thing is that there are so many people who manage to continue functioning. Yeah. Quite lengthy periods, uh, notwithstanding the amount of drink and drugs that they take, they hang in there and uh, there is a side of them that produces something as well as the negativity. That yes. Comes. Uh, the downside uh, that we experience when we become a, we, well, I was an addict. Um, yes. Addictive personality. And the addictive personality gave me the strength to keep pushing the work side. But the, then there's the negative side, which was pulling it down, pulling me in a different direction. And my health was going very much during, uh, I had liver troubles, I had a whole range of things uh, that uh, interfered with my progress during my 30s. Um, but in particular, I think mentally I was uh, being worn down by it. Yeah. At the end, the end of my 30s, I was, I was really at the end of my tether. Right. Uh, the marriage was falling apart. We'd had counselling to try and keep us together. And I ended up with a psychiatrist uh, uh, who said, in, uh, you, re- in- you realise, Clive, of course, you're, you're an, not, not just got a drinking problem, but you're an alcoholic. I said, no, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm hanging on to my job and I'm, I'm managing reasonably well. I think I'm going to be promoted, actually, um, because we've got a crowd of people who recognise, oh, they were all the same type of people, of course. <laughs> who promoted. And they thought you were a jolly good... Exactly, a jolly good fellow. A Great jolly one. good fellow, and he's, yeah... Yeah, no, I can imagine that. I mean, just as a diversion for a tiny second, I, you know, we used to work in the music business and uh, we re- we wanted a band to reform um, who were called Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. And, um, you, you, you know, they had a sort of spectacularly dodgy past, these people. We found out that the, the bass player, who I won't name, was a heroin addict working as a, a, a futures broker on Wall Street. I mean, it was it was extraordinary, and and he said, "Oh, well, of course I can come and do the reunion, but you have to fly me first class and this and that." And he he managed to. I mean, he could not believe that he was on selling pork belly futures on on Wall Street. Um, well, these conflicts, the paradox of life. Yeah, yeah. I think it's fascinating that people think of addicts and alcoholics and everything. It's always terribly black and white. They think. You know, they're on the park bench with the can of super. Yeah. But actually, it, 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 it's as, you, as you're describing very well. And tell me about, you know, Lorna and the marriage, because I know that it started off so well in 1967. And what, what would you say about that? Well, we're still married after 55 years. It's wow. Amazing. Yeah. One of the greatest achievements of my life is to... Uh, uh, stayed in a marriage when, in fact, all the evidence indicated it shouldn't have continued. And uh, Lorna, Lorna was uh, very tolerant and uh, loving with me. She liked to drink as well, uh, so there was a commonality between us there, but she didn't have the uh, uh, problems I had with it. She, she managed it much better um, until later in life. She's had some difficulties in later life with it. Right. We travelled a lot. We had a, we had a fascinating life. Uh, work took me all around the world, uh, as well as uh, working in the UK and negotiating in the UK. And Lorna often got the opportunity of travelling with me. I was uh, not the best of husbands. Um, with, uh, with the drink and the drugs came the acting out and, and of course, little affairs on the side. Yes, yes. Uh, which uh, there were many of them in different ways. Yes. Um, Men as well as women. Yes. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that sort of that goes back to the beginning, doesn't it? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, that's very honest. And uh, so, really, I mean, I know that you know we don't have to sort of be celebrating achievements, but you were the general secretary of the Public Services Tax and you know Commerce Union, and that was a post you held up until ninety eight. Yes. So indeed. what I mean, just if I ask the question, what would you say was the worst point in the alcoholism addiction and what was the light at the end of the tunnel, if it's possible to say? Well I think the worst point was when I started having uh, liver problems. How did that manifest? Well, I had I had uh, hepatitis B, uh, which was probably picked up from acting out, uh, um, linked with a drink, 
and then the liver started uh, deteriorating. And I was told if I continued on that route, um, the inevitable would happen. I'd get cirrhosis and I would have death. And I had little choice on it. I had to, it that would have happened. Yes. I would have been, uh, I was told by uh, the medics that uh, I'd, at 40, I'd got uh, another two years. Uh, I'd lose my marriage, I'd lose my uh, job, I'd lose everything, and I'd lose my life at the end of it if I continued drinking the way I was. So I had to make a, a big choice in my life. A different direction came. Uh, I was uh, on the knee, down at the bottom. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, I bent my knee and I happily uh, had a touch on the shoulder and I was picked up and uh, I found the AA program, 12-step program, got recovery on a day-by-day basis. Just one day at a time, I managed to uh, stay sober and uh, fairly early, re- very good results. I did extraordinary good work in my job, uh, explored new areas, uh, which uh, took me into contact with politics in a way I'd not really been as close to before. And uh, off I went. So when was, can I ask, when was the time when you joined AA and and stopped? That was in the uh, early 80s. I stopped drinking on the 12th of July, 1982. And I went went into AA uh, not long afterwards. Uh, I had therapy. Uh, The psychiatrist who diagnosed me as an alcoholic uh, put me onto a psychiatrist. I did some work there. But I needed uh, to be with people of uh, similar mind. Uh, yes. I went into AA and uh, uh, a, base, a smoky basement of a, a Baptist church in Westland Terrace <laughs> in, uh, in Pimlico and uh, went three times a week in, early in the morning. And then bit by bit, I stepped that, up the number of meetings I was doing. And, and that, that set you up. Change. That's, that changed my life. It gave me a, a power and a strength and a spirit that was quite new. And uh, I've stuck with AA right way through. And, and the 12-step program, I mean, is something that was created by the founders of AA, I think. And, and it basically, it's, it's, you know, like there's um, NA, um, there's a whole Narcotics range of Anonymous, there's all sorts of them. There's 26 different, uh, at least 26 different uh, 12-step programs in the UK, even more in America. In fact, you can any problem you've got, you can apply a 12-step approach to it and try to resolve it. It's my view. So uh, I've done some work on this uh, within Parliament. We've created a group of cross-party parliamentarians who have an interest in recovery from addiction. And uh, we have an all-party parliamentary group on the 12 steps, which is doing extraordinarily well. Wonderful. Well, I, I think I mentioned to you before, uh, before we, we recorded this, that uh, I had an a, actress friend of mine, quite well known, who got this part at the Theatre Royal Manchester or something, playing an alcoholic. And um, she said to me, oh, God, I don't know what to do. I really, I'm not an alcoholic. And I said, oh, well, I know people who are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took her to a meeting and she was so knocked out with it and you know she said god everybody needs this this 12 step stuff and i think that's a very interesting thought well i, I, mean, had, a, I had a similar experience with with one of my peer colleagues who was uh, an exceptionally talented scientist and economist i took him to an aa meeting he couldn't believe what it was like and he no. was a man he, he was a man who was involved in creating with tony blair and the labor government uh, talking therapy all right yes right yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, we'll we'll move on in a minute, but I mean, is it not that it's sort of founded on sort of principles, you know, expanded by Carl Carl Jung, sort of Christianity, common sense, basic basic psychology, isn't it? I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. It's uh, got uh, all the elements of history from. Uh, biblical point of view but it's also got psychology in there and it's got a very uh, clear uh, step-by-step method of enabling someone to accept they have a problem see ways and recognizing they're not the center of the universe any longer which is what i thought i was (laughs) but there was uh, some power greater than me and i needed to have a look at what i've done wrong and to seek to put it right and to make amends to the people i'd harmed 
and uh, and to work with others and to help others, uh, which is then the fundamentals uh, for spiritual awakening. Yes. So it is all to do. I mean, a lot to do with sort of clearing up perhaps what happened in your childhood or what triggers it all. I mean, the I great mean, benefit I got, uh, if I got nothing else out of AA, I had a reconciliation with my father towards the end of his life. Ah, uh, interesting. We, uh, yes, we learned to love each other, having had uh, years of enmity. And that came directly out of uh, working the steps, the step four, where I uh, had to have a look at my, my resentments towards my father and then see if there'd been any parts on, in me which had created resentments and the disharmony. And of course there were. And I saw him in a quite different light uh, to what I'd done previously. Gosh, and, uh, that's so we, we, we made up, yeah. That's really something. And what about your brothers? Uh, my brothers, um, uh, I had a good relationship with them, but they're all dead now. Uh, I'm an orphan. <laughs> oh, Clive, that's a very tragic situation. We'll have to send around some friends immediately. <laughs> Abandoned, but I do actually have a lot of company. Oh, well, yes. A great, great fellowship. <laughs> and Lorna, did that, has that sort of kept it together? I mean, do you think if you hadn't gone into AA, 12 step fellowships, etc., that perhaps that. that oh, the, when it, the, the marriage would have gone years ago. And in fact, uh, in days when I was not on the best of forms, you'd say you would need to get to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I think I think that's brilliant. I mean, I'm I'm told that this is probably relevant for anyone listening who's you know who's at the beginning of this sort of journey, as they say. That the issue with being an addict is that it's rather there is a bit of a jack in the box effect. You can put down one thing, oh yes, and then Bing, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly you know if, you, you're, if you're an addict, you're an addict. So yeah. you you you. you uh, think you've conquered one. We never quite conquer it, but at least uh, we're managing it better than immediately. I, mean, I had problems with, with food all the time, and I had always acting out with sex. Right, right. <laughs> lifetime of it. <laughs> right. And I've done 12-step programs on those topics as well, but um, there's probably I was addicted to work. And again, success to a degree, to the extent I've had success, has come from my willingness to work hard. But and I think it, that goes back to an addiction to work. But I wonder whether I could put that idea to you that, you know, a lot of that is to do with self-esteem, you know, that that if we work like maniacs, we're, what we're really doing is is actually trying to boost our self-esteem, feel, feel great about ourselves because we've achieved that. I think to an extent, but if you do the... If, if, if you practice the programme which I'm practising... Uh, there is a stage beyond that, and uh, because uh, I reach the point where I will no longer be in Parliament or in public life, uh, and uh, I will still, I think, be on a journey and still learning. Yeah. And, so yes, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah. I just meant that I think, I, I, when I'm in, because of a separate thing that I do with mental health talks, etc., you know, that self-esteem seems to be such an important area um of, of a lot of mental problems yes and we, we 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 get our recognition often with the work we do yes where per, our perception of others comes from our efforts of work um but it's uh, it i increasingly see it's only part of life yeah 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 no i mean <clears throat> i remember being you know t.s Eliot wrote in a play of his you know he said we we like to be thought well of by others yeah. in order to think well of ourselves you know and uh, and we know all that, but it, it, it's interesting. Mo right, moving on, um, I'm going to tell you a really fascinating statistic. During your time in the Lords, you have made 517 contributions uh, in the Chamber uh, and, and, and citations and submitted 179 written questions to government departments. Um now, I think that's a hell of a lot. And, but one of the things that caught my eye was this, that you made a, a submission to the Department of Health and Social Care, so we do do our research here, um, to ask Her Majesty's Government whether they plan to take further action to encourage NHS users to accept greater responsibility for their health. And I, I just thought that was very interesting. Um, 
uh, you know, because I, I also think it's interesting um, that how the media depict Labour politicians and Labour peers. You know, it's a, I, I think that's I think it's great, but I want to know. Is that is that something that you um, that you've come to believe, um, and you know that you've actually done it yourself? Well, I've done it with a great deal of assistance from others around me, um, but it, uh, I spent much of my life, life blaming others for yeah. what has gone wrong with my life. And uh, through the program I worked, I came to accept uh, where I'd made the mistakes, and it was up to me. Uh, with any assistance I could get from the programme to pull them right, which really brings it back to personal responsibility, which is normally, I suppose, if you put it in those terms, attached to the Tories rather than Labour. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think both Labour and the Conservatives at the moment are not straightforwardly enough in their dealings with the public. Uh, they don't... Uh, they're so frightened of voters in many areas they do not tell what needs to be told. Yes. And, and that is about individuals themselves have to accept responsibility. You cannot see the state or an employer or a doctor or somebody else to solve all your problems. You have to be prepared yourself to accept your part in it and do the best you can to move forward. Yeah. Uh, for example, we've got great problems with obesity. People should be told they need to reduce the amount they're eating. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, no, but I think I and think that, that's that, I know it's offensive to many people, <laughs> but people often uh, welcome it when they're advised. Uh, but these days, we are so careful and frightened of uh, hurting people, and in turn, that is really about hurting ourselves. Uh, well, we live in it. We live. Um, we live in a media state, um, don't we? I mean, you know, where everyone's frightened of uh, upsetting the media, it seems to me, or politicians are, um, you know, and who's running the country? But that's perhaps, <laughs> maybe I'm getting out of order. I mean, I, I, I know I've read somewhere uh, that you have, a, you know, an unusual and, I, for me, a very welcome view uh, about the NHS, you know, that I don't know whether you can say that or not. Um, you know, that, you know, the NHS, I can say, it, is broken. Um, and, you know, we've got, to, we have to change, I think, the way we're going. Is that not right? Um, well, we're continuing to have an ever-aging population with a smaller workforce. And, and we live longer, so the costs get higher. Um, we have to find ways in which uh, we will continually review uh, our operations. And I think we are near the edge with the NHS at the moment. Uh, I've had a lot of experience of it recently with, with my wife's not being well and I've been unwell. And uh, I ended up having a lifetime of spent campaigning for the NHS. And I ended up having to go privately. Yes. And I learned quite a bit from that. And I, I've told my party what I'd learned from it, that... Uh, we should really uh, listen to the people who worked in the NHS, gone outside and why they're outside and what would it take to persuade them to go back into the NHS to work? Because that's the fundamental problem we have at the moment, a shortage of skilled staff at all levels within the NHS. Uh, what do we learn from people who've gone elsewhere? Um, in turn, um, people like me have money. Yeah. Um, I should pay more. Yeah. Uh, I think we... Uh, we, we should look at the fundamental issue about uh, free at the point of entry there. Uh, I know everybody is strongly committed to that. I believe in due course we will have to review that and what we'll be looking for, and there's nothing wrong with that, that those who can pay should pay more. Yeah, well, you know, maybe everybody... That's not accepted by my party. No, I, I, not I, even I, by I, the I, present I, government. Either. I realise that's but not it, a brave it, thing to it, say. It, it, it will come. Yeah. Well, it has, I mean, yeah. All the health service will continue in decline. Yeah, and get worse um, and worse. Yeah, well, okay, well, anyway, there we go. Um, um, you know, I know that you want to, you know, you've become the patron of Sugarwise, and, um, you know, that we were talking just a bit, a minute about, ago about obesity and all of that. 
Um, do you just want to say a tiny bit about that? Well, I, I've been interested in, in um, the, the harm done to people through alcohol and drugs, spent a lot of time working on that. That took me into calories and into weight and sugar, uh, how much sugar people consume, they don't know. Uh, if you drink, you don't know often just how much sugar you're consuming. Um, if you're eating, and, uh, there is, you may see the labels, but very difficult to read. But is there something... Um, I, I think at the heart of it, sugar is the major addiction that we have in society. Right. It, it leads into diabetes, to obesity, and in turn into heart problems. There's a whole range of issues linked to it. Uh, yet sugar is never really seen in, those, in, the, in that kind of light. Right. It's been so damaging. Uh, fat is too, but I think sugar seems to escape <laughs> the same scrutiny. Right. And uh, there are alternatives to sugar which uh, are not pursued or explored in a way that they could be. Uh, stevia, for example, is a, yeah. a, a, a 20 times stronger than sugar, but doesn't have uh, the same uh, side effects that sugar has on you, yet is not used. I and mean, I think it's kept out of public, um, public, the public side by the efforts of the sugar industry. Yeah, sure. Well, it's like the tobacco industry, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Not quite in their interest. Too. So I'm doing some, doing some work on exploring that, trying to persuade the government to uh, a great believer in Henry Dimbleby's report, which suggested that sugar should be taxed at source, right at source. And so the cost of it goes down the line and hopefully discourages people from uh, spending money on it. I think, I mean, if I can put in a two pennies worth, I think like a lot of things, it's education, um, you know, that most people don't, most people don't think anything about sugar because they're going, well, what, what's he going on about sugar? It's right. You know? So I, I tend to think, I mean, I say that again, from the point of view of somebody who talks to a lot of schools, you know, that, that maybe I should, and it's difficult because you, you know, I, I think um, people go, Oh no, not another thing I can't do, but I think it needs to be put across in a really, bright way you know don't you you know where just as you've said actually look there are plenty of alternatives and if you do these alternatives you're not going to get you know the problems exactly anyway okay right clive we've got to that very important part of the show now which is we call this part of the show the life jackets and these are the things that you <clears throat> when the chips are down when you know the Thames is overflowing, you know what do you you know? And you, you're in you're in the you're in the life raft with Lorna, and you think, oh, well, we're going to have to put some life jackets on to keep us going, to keep us afloat. So you know, you know, normally what we say is, what's what's your favourite? You know, what what film would you want to be take? Remember um, what? Uh, what what novel, what book, what prayer, what pet, what hobby. I mean, there's all sorts of things, as you know, that we've sent you. <laughs> and I know that you say to me, well, I, I, I'm, I hardly do any of those things because I'm so busy. <laughs> But there must, I know that, I know we talked about a film. Well, there are some things that, I mean, if I was in a lifeboat, I would pray. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> Okay. Okay. I spent quite a bit of my life praying now, meditating. But uh, I would, uh, I mean, I, if I was looking for entertainment, uh, because we do need entertainment in life and lightness, uh, I would probably look for some zany films to take with me, like Blazing Saddles. Uh, great, didn't great, you? Great. Didn't you say to me um, once that uh, you were a bit of a fan of Airplane? Yes, I like airplanes, craziness. I think I that's like Forrest Gump as well. All oh, right. <laughs> okay. <all> well, <laughs> but airplane, I think is is uh, you know I saw that not so long ago. It is very, very, very funny, and it's yes, completely mad. I mean, the pilot, um, Leslie Nielsen, and the other guy, uh, and 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 the the one um, where you know there's the there's the guy who's come on the plane. He's been jilted. You know, by his girlfriend, and he can't stop telling everybody about him. He sits next to an old lady. 
<laughs> and he's going, so then? <laughs> and in the end, you know, 10 minutes later, she's hung herself. And that's not very PC. <laughs> Amazing film. <laughs> um, tell me about you and dogs. Well, I I had cancer in my mid fifties. Bowel cancer. Yes, we didn't talk about that. No, no, we didn't. But it uh, runs in the family. And um, I was in I was in hospital in the Royal Marston. I was in room and uh, pumping morphine into myself after the operation. And I had a painting on the wall by a woman called Helen Paul. It was a painting of a little French village scene with a a stall with vegetables and fruit and, and a little dog sat next to the stall and the oh. dog's head because of the <laughs> because of the morphine I was taking I was out seeing sets the dog's head was jumping up and down and, oh, right. and nodding <laughs> and I'd never had a dog and I thought if this dog is with me during and gone the dog, this hell I'm going through and is keeping me company I'm going to have a dog when I come out of hospital uh, which is what I got I, I got a Ken Terrier called uh, Daisy. And, right. Uh, and, and we've had Ken Terriers for over 20 years with no children. We've got Ken Terriers instead. Uh, and theirs are the children. <laughs> yes, very much so. And what, uh, the current one? Current one is Barney. Um, Bar Barney is Barney, people say, but absolutely loved. He was a show dog, successful show dogs. The shows, when they stop winning, they get rid of them, they offload them. Right, and uh, so we he came to us as a rescue a rescue dog uh, after we'd lost the previous one, had the previous one put down. And, Great, uh, he's ten, he's about ten. Wonderful right, dog. everybody knows him, loves him. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Um, well, um. I'd have him in the boat with us. <laughs> oh, good. No, that's great. Okay, so we've got that. We've got the now. Uh, what of, uh, you may have to take some, you know, um, plants with you. I mean, are, are you a gardener? Do a little bit. We've got a terrace here, and uh, we've got a garden around us where we live in Battersea, overlooking the River Thames. And um, I have a. I'm surrounded by a particular shrub that I'm attached to, Cotinus grace. I've got one on the terrace and I've got one at the front of the house, one at the front of the flat, one at the side. And I give them away as gifts to people who are particularly close to me. Oh, great. Oh, they that's are. Good. And it's an extraordinary plant. Its leaves change colour and they are wonderful in the autumn, deep red and golden colours with veins in them. And uh, I love them. So, culture oh. the so that's so basically a window box could come in the boat. Just about. It needs to grow a little bit more than a window box. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, a big, one, a of big things, one of the things um, I, I, I think we may have omitted to tell you, um, but don't worry about it, is that um, we normally ask everybody who comes on the uh, show, um, not right now, but to. Um, my grandfather was a very well-known gardener, um, and his was as well um, from Anglesey. And um, we have a we have a we have this book, which is here. And oh, yes. my grandfather wrote this book, and it's a very racy title, considering it was written in 1940 or something. Um, and we just ask each guest to read a couple of pages. Um, so I hope uh, we could contact you later and um, oh, we should have asked you that. at the beginning. Yeah, I'll certainly do that. Oh, well, that's great. That's and a lovely title as well. Making Love to Mother Earth. Very naughty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> um, so, you know, that's great. So, OK, look, we'll just finish on this. A couple of things. Um, you know, we're in the boat. And do you have something... Um, do you have something that you do, you know, with stress, you know, and, oh, my God, stress, you know, that you do uh, that sort of d deals with it? I mean, maybe it's walking the dog. I don't know. Some people, some people, you know, do the washing up, they empty the dishwasher, they do something manual. I mean, what about you? Well, I think mainly, uh, I mentioned it earlier, meditating and mindfulness. I was doing mindfulness yesterday evening with a crowd of people. In the really? Office. And I uh, uh, meditate every day. I think that's what... Uh, on my knees. Right. 
Right. And that's what cools me down and gives me a better perspective of life and gives me the spirit and the power to get up and go. And then uh, next is walking the dog and seeing the beauty of uh, God's creation around me. Great. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. Back to your, back to, back to your grandfather. <laughs> yes. No, no. Well, he was uh, quite interesting, actually. Um, well, we, you know, there were a million things we could have talked about, but we've talked about the really important ones, I think. Um, um, so these are the last two, honestly, the last two things I'm going to say. Uh, I just want you to comment on this. Um, a Scottish doctor called Dr. Ronnie McTavish in 1885 was asked, uh, what do you need to be happy? And Dr. McDavish said, you need three things. One, you need something to do. Two, you need something or someone to love. And three, you need something to hope for. Would you, what do you feel about that? Oh, I've got no problem with those at all. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, the fundamental is that uh, ultimately we, we end on our own. And uh, we're either comfortable on our own or we're not. And if I'm comfortable on my own, that invariably means I'm with my maker. Um, I am expressing gratitude for what I've had. I'm looking to the future with hope. And uh, I should, but don't do it very much. I should be praising the glory of God. Um, but that may be something for me to do more later in life. Yeah, when you're a bit older. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Final question now. So <clears throat> I, I pretty well know the answer to this, but, you know, it, you know, you uh, let's just say, you know, somebody who's 17, 18 turns up on knocking on the House of the Lord's door uh, wanting to talk to Lord Brooke <clears throat> and, um, you know, is in a bit of a two and eight, not knowing what to do with her life and got this problem and that problem, you know, psychological or, and what do you think? What do you, I mean, you, you know, if, if, if it was like you age that, you know, age 16, 17, what would you say now to that person? I think the only I've got, the one thing that, I've learned is that the less I have, the more I have, which is quite contrary to all that we're taught, which is that we need more and more. And uh, mm. that is an, an amazing revelation which has come to me that in each decade I've let something go. And as I've let that go, I've become happier. I need to, I needed to drink less because as we talked about it, but I needed to eat less. I think I probably need to travel less. And I think if I can come closer to my uh, home community, life gets better to a group, to an individual. Um, I would say to the 17-year-old, uh, um, work hard. It is satisfying. Mm. Look after your health. But in particular, try to work with others and help others, and you'll find you get amazing dividends coming back, uh, way beyond what you'd ever expected. Brilliant, brilliant! I think that's really great. Uh, what can I say? Thank you so much, um, Clive. You, um, you've, you know, that's really been a wonderful um, show, and uh, I hope, I hope we'll have you back. Um, when you're 90 um, or 100, I don't mind. I'll do a deal with you. Um, you get extra bonus. I'll go for 90 for the time being. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Really great. Tip top and totally tidy. Bye. Bye. Great, brilliant, Clive. Thanks. That was great. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I didn't talk I, about the bowel cancer. That's really annoying. No, it's all right. I didn't think I was as sharp as last time. Oh, I think you were. I no, I mean, I think, think we, I mean, the point is, 
you know, I, I, I can send you what we did last time and we can always mix it. Um, I, I think the only thing that you did last time that was quite nice was you, um, you were quite sort of, uh, you sort of, you made a thing about Lorna the last not time. Not this time. No, <laughs> no. Oh, that, my, that my, was, my mood changes. <laughs> yeah, that was sort of like, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Whilst last week it was, well, what can you say? You know, it was. It was. I've had some ups and downs the last couple of days, but never mind. <laughs> well, you're doing uh, anyway. You're staying up. I mean, God, blimey, good for you. I don't. I couldn't do it. I mean, how was the doctor all right? Uh, it's been put off, so it's all right. Right, got it. Uh, I think there may be a gallstone. Oh right, but uh, uh, the pain has gone away, and uh, these, it may have been exercising that's moved it. And uh, I mean, I had kidney stones years ago, absolutely awful, and um, they they were worried because of the treatment I had early in the year that you sometimes have blood clots that can float around and cause obstructions, and that can become quite dangerous. So that was the worry why they sent me off to A and E, and it wasn't in the lungs, and uh, it was uh, not in the uh, um, bladder. Um, but uh, they think it's uh, nor in the kidneys. The, the pain was in the kidney point. They thought it was in in the uh, gallbladder. So they're going to have a look at that and see what comes. But I'm I'm feeling okay. False alarm. To Good. Me. Okay. Not, not 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 quite a false alarm, but. Not as worrying as I thought. The other thing that happened was that they did an ECG on me and were worried by it. And they come back and said, "We'd like to do another ECG. Will you get in this chair, please? And we'll push you along wheelchair." What for? I said because we're just a bit worried. Oh my God, I've got heart trouble. <laughs> yeah, but you're in, you're in good shape. It was it was okay. They did it, and uh, I think I just got uh, elevated. Uh, uh, blood pressure and the rest of it. Through. I mean, they're bloody impossible, those places. Five hours I was there, which, and it was full of youngsters. I couldn't believe it. This is still Chelsea Westminster. I said to the nurse, uh, first one I saw, I said, why are all these youngsters here? She said, we thought we might have not had them here tonight. They'd have been watching the football. <laughs> Christ. They just go there and send it to the doctors. Wow. I mean, the whole thing is in a mess. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're totally right about that. I mean, you know, and someone needs to bite the bullet and say it, you know, and do something. Because it's, it, you can't... It's, well, people are saying it, but... I you've mean, got, yeah, but you're turning around an oil tanker, aren't you? I mean, yeah. I mean, the thing is, what you said, uh, I was hoping, well, I, don't, I wasn't going to... You you got to have you've got to have some level of subscription, you know. Where I'm paying a hundred pounds a year, you know. Ted's paying five hundred, and you know, and and maybe Sid's paying five pounds. But you know, even if you you've got to have something. Well, we find it in all areas. It's good. I mean, they just sent us these checks um, for energy. <laughs> Why me? As people should be getting double the amount, and me none. Yeah, no, no, crazy. I can pay my bills, but anyway, that's uh, looking for votes. It's all about how the votes. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And anyway. the, uh, you don't say anything that upset people about the NHS. Is that well, no, of course you don't. No one will say anything about that. Some but that's. Enemies. They won't say anything about food, about drink. Um, although they're going to do one or two things, I believe. A little bit of uh, education work, to use your phrase, is going to take place, I think. But we need a lot more of it. How are well, you, anyway? Well? How are you? Uh, not bad. Good. <laughs> not bad. That's a very good one. Uh, we got that from Jeremy. <laughs> What? Not bad. Not bad. That was that was Jeremy's always. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll tell you later. 
<laughs> oh dear. No, no, no. It's all right. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just trying to get through this. Um. Uh, you know, doing these films and workshops and all this sort of stuff, and I've put, I've put so much into it in the last six months that, um, you know, and of course now I'm going. Oh, now I've got to. <laughs> Now I've got to sell them or market them, and but I get it's that. It's always more work. You have to be careful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, try and, and, I, and less, I realize try and do less and less. I wake. I wake. No, you're right. I, but I woke up this morning. Jane's in London. I'm in some, Wink Anton, and um, you know, I mean, I wake up at four in the morning, going oh, now, you know, Oh, and no. and I and I said I woke up this morning. And I went. You give le- you give talks to people about life work balance and don't um, practice it. What are you? You know. <laughs> anyway, listen. I'll um, we'll we'll, we'll catch up. Um, okay. Anyway, but thanks so now. much, Clive. <laughs> thank you. You're a rocker, and uh, I'll, let, I'll let you know. I'll let you know, and he, when we, we, we get it, we'll get it right and get it together, and let you know when it's going to go so out. I, I've, I've done my bit anyway. Okay, you, ha- you have All right. Yeah, <laughs> you're a top man. Thank you so much. Take care. God bless. All right, I'll speak to you. I'll see you very soon. Not too spiritual, was it? Too godly. I'm, I'm becoming a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. It, it was fine. There was plenty in there. All right. Okay. Uh, bye.